Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Pilu and the organizers for um, inviting me to be part of this. And uh, too bad I, could, I couldn't really attend yesterday, uh, the previous two days. Uh, but I'm very happy to be part of this session uh, with, with Rafael and, and Michael, because uh, um, of course I'm very interested in their work, but I think we have a lot of ideas in common. So I'm gonna, in my talk, I'm gonna talk about um, decision-making and in particular the contributions of cortical and subcortical structures uh, to decisions about actions. Um, but I want to start off with a kind of uh, putting these, uh, discussing these structures in an evolutionary context. Um, so here is uh, the phylogenetic tree of animals expanded along the lineage that leads to humans. And by comparing different animals, we can infer when certain structures appeared in this lineage. Um, and so there's a general consensus that the earliest structure that we can really recognize coming to all animals with neurons is the hypothalamus, which all along has been doing the sort of high level decision making of behavioral state control, things like uh, sleep versus wake, seek food versus rest, as well as certain aspects of foraging. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, Thomas Hills and others have suggested that the original role of dopamine is, is a sort of tonic level that tells you if things are good, you sort of wanna stay where you are. If things are not so good, you might wanna go and explore a bit more widely. Now in uh, chordates, you get the spinal cord and the tectum, which together implement oriented responses uh, to the world. So decisions between things like approach versus avoidance um, and spatial orientations to particular um, targets in the world. And the tectum of, will become the superior colliculus in, in, uh, in mammals. <clears throat> now in early vertebrates, you get an expansion of the forebrain. You get the thalamus, the pallium and the subpallium. Uh, the latter two of which are actually an expansion of part of the hypothalamus. And they're uh, again, expanding these, uh, some of these high level decisions to a more local level, um, more precise um, specialization for different aspects of foraging, like um, exploiting the things in a local environment versus exploring elsewhere. This is the role of the medial pallium, which will become the hippocampus. And the subpallium includes what we call the basal ganglia, um, introducing a new role for dopamine, a more phasic, uh, more localized um, <clears throat> uh, reward signal motivating uh, different types of behaviors. Um, again, such as exploiting, exploring, etc. So the cerebellum appears around here about 500 million years ago um, and confers presumably um, predictive uh, control. Uh, and then in mammals, you get the cerebral cortex, the neocortex, which really is an expansion of part of the pallium. Again, um, expanding more finely these kinds of uh, behaviors, uh, such as exploitation, um, to allow a much broader behavioral repertoire um, of uh, land-based animals. <clears throat> Essentially, um, generalizing spatial foraging to a wider range of spatial interactions of, of which mammals are capable. So it's things like walking versus biting versus burrowing, et cetera, each of which uh, in early mammals uh, had sort of uh, dedicated idiosyncratic action maps in the neocortex for, for governing these different kinds of behaviors. Now, of course, in primates, uh, this expands still further, in particular, the prefrontal cortex, conferring what have been suggested as more abstract decision-making, uh, more abstract roles. So within this context, we can actually distinguish a series of different decision systems, a sort of ancient hypothalamic uh, decision system, selecting behavioral states, a tectal system for oriented action, approach versus avoidance, um, a subpallial or basal ganglia, a system for selecting different types of behaviors like exploit versus explore, reach versus walk. And then at the cortex, you get this sort of uh, more finer level of decision making. If you've decided to reach, what do you reach? If you've decided to walk, which way do you walk, et cetera. And so I'm really going to discuss uh, just these two, um, uh, these last two, and how they, um, uh, how they contribute to uh, decision making. And I'm going to do that really in the context of, uh, of a motivating factor in much of animal behavior, namely reward rate. Um, so, <clears throat> and so here's, here my talk is going to become very mathematical. Um, the reward rate can be characterized uh, by this kind of equation uh, where you have P of T is the probability of achieving a favorable outcome given some time spent T spent deciding and planning times the subjective utility of that outcome to the subject. Um, C is the subjective cost of trying, including things like metabolic costs, opportunity costs, et cetera. 
And then the denominator, we have the, the time uh, spent uh, deciding and planning, the time spent moving, and the time before you can try again, for example, into trial interval in, a, in an experiment. <clears throat> so this, you can think of this as a kind of a time discounted expected utility function. And it actually has the same form as harvest intake and foraging theory, which applies to a lot of animal behavior. Now, I wanna just describe, discuss some, some uh, implications of certain assumptions we can make about this function. In particular, the shape of this probability uh, uh, function here. For almost any decision-making mechanism, I think, you can assume that the probability of achieving a favorable outcome improves with time because you get more information because you think about it more. But at some point, of course, uh, so, so let's say it'll start at 50% for a two alternative cho choice task and then rise perhaps to some 100%. So at some point, there's going to be diminishing returns. Um, now, because of that, we can conclude that the reward rate function is going to have a peak somewhere there's going to be a point in time where that reward rate would be highest um, uh, obtained from this particular try. <clears throat> um, and we can do just with a little algebra, you can find that peak just by finding where the first derivative of this is equal to zero and the second derivative is negative. Uh, and and, and you, can, you can do the algebra, you can work this out, you can see that this, this is the, the equation that tells you um, where this peak is. In fact, it tells you the level of confidence at which you should commit. This is the best time to commit. Um, and it's related to this, um, this equation. Now, um, I want to next show a sort of a geometric interpretation of the implications of this uh, equation, the solution to the reward rate peak. Um, I'm going to put time zero here. I'm going to put chance level here. And so therefore, this is our function p of t uh, for some trial group. Um, now, I'm going to put. Uh, m plus d over here, and c divided by u over here. And then I'm going to draw a tangent line from this point to find this point of intersection, which then is I'm going to use to define the time spent deciding. Now, why uh, do I do this? Is because this geometric shape is actually the solution to that equation. Um, you can see that this, this part here is the first term. It's the slope at this point times t plus m plus d. And this part here is just c divided by u. So this is essentially a solution to this equation. Now, you can imagine some trials uh, are going to be much easier in which your probability of getting them correct is, is going to rise really fast. But some trials are going to be much, much um, harder. And so it's going to take you longer to have a good chance of getting a favorable outcome. So you can draw tangent lines to all of these. And that defines a kind of a accuracy criterion um, that we, you should use to make your decision. In other words, if you're anywhere over here, you should keep, um, you should keep, uh, can you see my pointer right away? I'm just, this is just a little fast. Okay. So if you're anywhere over here, you should continue thinking, maybe give the world more time to give you some more information. But as time passes and you cross this uh, criterion, you should go, go for it, just take a guess. And this will do better than any um, fixed criterion of accuracy. Um, uh, across a group of trials. Because you can see, even though you might do as well here on this trial, on easy trials, you will have, if you just waited slightly longer, you could have essentially eliminated all chance of errors. Whereas on these hard trials, you, you really should not have taken this much time, wasted this much time waiting. And so this will give you a sort of the optimal um, uh, reward rate across these trials. Now imagine, so the, the take home message is we want an accuracy criterion that decreases over time. Um, now imagine the cost is higher. Uh, well, then you get this accuracy criterion and that makes sense. You should be a bit more conservative, should be uh, wait a little bit longer if, if, every try, if every attempt incurs a larger cost. If you have um, a shorter inter-trial interval, um, then you might want to uh, move more quickly and drop, again, drop your accuracy criterion more quickly, be more hasty. So we, in general, we want an accuracy criterion that decreases with time but it should actually be context dependent. Um, <clears throat> so now uh, the implications, okay, again, is that a criterion of accuracy should decrease over time and it should depend on context. Now, how could this be implemented in the brain? You could imagine a decreasing threshold for your evidence um, computation process or what's sometimes called collapsing bounds or equivalently from a mathematical standpoint, you can combine evidence with a rising urgency signal. So in other words, you have some signal in the brain related to the evidence that you have, and then you combine that in some way with some signal which is non-specific. It just 
at some function of time that, that, that rises over time. You combine this in some, some way, let's say multiplicatively, uh, to produce neural activity that rises to, let's say, some constant neural initiation threshold. So this is not the criterion of accuracy. This is just neural initiation. Uh, that'll give you actually the same behavior. So this is what we've called the urgency gating model. Um, and uh, this has actually been described earlier by others, including Jochen Dietrich. Um, and the basic proposal is that decisions actually involve two signals. There's some kind of computation of the evidence for or against a given choice, which may be low pass filter to eliminate noise. Um, and that's combined with some choice independent but context dependent urgency signal. And these get combined somehow to produce neural activity that, that rises over time, uh, that biases a competition between potential actions. And so when some particular action um, gets strong enough, uh, it wins that competition. That's the basic idea. Now, implicit in this model is a controversial claim um, that uh, got us into a lot of hot water, in, in, in fact, because we suggest that this buildup that's been seen in so many um, decision-making experiments perhaps is not really so much due to accumulation of evidence. Uh, in fact, it's primarily due to this rising urgency function. Uh, and I think this is difficult to uh, um, determine in many experiments. And, and if, if um, people in the audience would like to get into this debate, we can do that at the end. Um, I would like to uh, just invite you to read a paper which we published some years ago uh, that we think addresses this uh, quite directly, um, showing in fact that, that, um, that evidence accumulation in many tasks is probably not going on um, in any... Um, sort of long time constant type model. Anyway, but I don't really wanna get into that particular debate uh, in my talk. Uh, what I wanna address is um, implications of this, these, uh, this idea of urgency. And one is uh, the question of what is the neural mechanism? Uh, where are these evidence and urgency signals combined? How do they lead to commitment? And this is the work of my former postdoc, David Thura, who now has his own lab in Lyon. Uh, and the other question is what are some broader implications of this to things like individual differences between, um, between humans, as well as pathological conditions. And the, this is the work of a PhD student, Matthew Carlin. So I'll start with David's work. How can we find the neural correlates of evidence, urgency, and the mechanism, mechanism of commitment? Um, to look for these, we need a task that really dissociates these processes. And what we've done with David is we've used this, what we call this tokens task. The idea here is that uh, you, need to, uh, you just need to guess which of these two targets is going to receive the majority of these tokens that jump one every 200 milliseconds randomly. And then you just move the cursor to the target that gets the most tokens. If you, if you get it right, you get a reward, otherwise you don't, but you get to try again. Importantly though, in this task, you don't have to wait until the end. If you think you know which one is gonna get it, you can go ahead and move quickly. And notice that when you do that, as soon as you move, the remaining tokens speed up. So this presents you with a speed axis trade-off. Um, you can either wait till the end and be really sure, or you can take an early guess, risk getting it wrong, but potentially save a lot of time and improve your reward rate. <clears throat> the other advantage of this task is that at any moment in time, we can actually quantify what is the evidence for the target. So for example, what is the probability that the right target will be correct uh, as of given the number of tokens in that target versus the other target versus remaining in the center. And this is this complicated equation. Now we can use this to the, essentially represent every individual trial as a profile in this probability over time space. Every time a token jumps, the probability changes. Now the token jumps are actually completely random, but we can um, post hoc classify trials uh, into ones that are easy, like this one, where you pretty much know which target's going to be correct. Um, trials in which it's more ambiguous. You don't really know which target's gonna be correct until much later. As well as trials that are misleading in which the first few tokens actually jump in the direction that will ultimately not be the correct one. So we're looking at these, these different trial types and I'll, and I'll come back to this. Um, but the other thing we can do is any particular individual trial, we detect the time uh, the subject began to move from kinematics. And then we use, we, we try to estimate what are the non-decision delays, the sensory and motor delays. Um, and we estimate them using the mean reaction time in a task in which all the tokens just jump at once. Uh, and that gives us an estimate of the time at which the decision was actually made, which then allows us to estimate the success probability at which the subject uh, made their decision. Um, and um, 
And that now defines a period of time we can call deliberation when they're thinking about it and the process of committing and initiating the action. Now, um, I'm gonna show you data from monkeys. Uh, so here are our two monkeys, behavioral data. And as, as you might expect, monkeys make decisions more quickly in easy trials than ambiguous or misleading trials. Um, but their level of evidence of success probability at which they, they make their choices differs. And in fact, it seems to be reducing over time. So if you just plot the success probability function for a, um, average across a certain group of trials, and then you mark when the decision was made, you'll see a, a kind of, you see a kind of a dropping um, accuracy criteria, what looks like a dropping accuracy criteria. Now we can actually use this to derive um, more precisely the urgency signal, the putative agents, urgency signal from behavior. <clears throat> and the way we do it is for each trial, we calculate the evidence available at the time of, of, that the monkey made his decision. And we're gonna, instead of doing that complicated function, we're just gonna do a sort of simplified sum log of likelihood function, which is really equivalent to the number of tokens in one versus the number of tokens in the other. And then we're going to group trials based on how many tokens jumped uh, when they made their decision. And then we, uh, for each, we're gonna calculate a mean. And this is what we get, okay? This kind of uh, inverted U function, we get this also for monkey Z, slightly different, but similar shape. Now you can imagine this here looks like a dropping criterion. The evidence you need as a function of time is less and less as time is passing. But what about this first part? Well, it turns out we can actually model this with a very simplistic version of, of the urgency gating model. So if neural activity related to some choice is just some filtered version, low pass filtered version of the evidence um, times the urgency function over time compared to some threshold. Now, the evidence we're just going to say is the number of tokens in one versus minus number of tokens in the other. And we don't really need the low pass filter because uh, there's no noise uh, in this task. And we think whatever low pass filters there has a fairly short time constant. Um, and then the urgency function, we're just going to say it's just a linear, linear function, just slope and intercept. Um, and then finally, we're going to add just a Gaussian source of intertrial variability um, that just sometimes makes the activity higher, sometimes lower. And we're going to fix all the parameters except these two, and we're just going to exhaustively search for the uh, slope and intercept parameters that provide the best fit to these uh, observed data. And here it is for monkey S and for monkey Z. Um, and uh, you'll see that the match that this produces to the data is actually extremely good, even for this rising part. So again, this part is not surprising, but why, how do we explain this part? It, that simply has to do with variability that sometimes this, this um, variability is very, very high. This activity, ma this makes the activity very, very high, which means you make it essentially a wild guess. But if you're making a wild guess, the evidence is probably hasn't had time yet to, to rise uh, to be high. And that explains these curves quite well. Um, now, another thing uh, that I mentioned at the beginning is remember as you, when you reach the target, the remaining tokens speed up. So you actually get your reward here. So they jump every 200 milliseconds, and then after they move, after you reach your target, uh, they jump every 150. Um, so that's a that's a slight savings of time. We call this the so-called slow block. But we also run the task in a separate block of trials in which the speed up is much more significant. Here, the tokens jump every 50 milliseconds. This is the fast block. So here, you should be more willing to take a guess than in the slow block. Uh, but everything up to this point is exactly the same. <clears throat> so one question is: Do monkeys adjust their behavior to this? And uh, yes, they do very clearly. They make the de decision durations are longer in the slow than in the fast block. They make their decisions at a higher level of success probably in the slow than in the fast block. But their reward rate actually is higher uh, in the fast, as you might expect. And here are the reaction time distributions. As you can see, they're all shifted to the, to the left, as you would expect. Now, just like we derived the urgency function for the slow block here in blue, we can do that for the fast block. So we get the same data and we do the same kind of fit. And here's the, the fit for monkey um, S and here it is for monkey Z. For both case, in both cases, the urgency, the sort of inferred urgency signal starts higher in the fast block than in the slow, but then they eventually converge, which actually makes sense since the difference between the blocks later in the trial is not as significant. So now we can look for neural correlates of this because we have a way of identifying what evidence should look like so for example, evidence in favor of a cell's preferred target versus the other target in the different trial types. And we have an idea of what the urgency function should look like as well. Um, <clears throat> the basic hypothesis we're using is that the dorsal stream provides the uh, information about what are the candidate actions. 
and then there's a competition that goes on in the sensory motor system. And I'm gonna particularly look at dorsal premotor cortex or PMD and primary motor cortex or M1. Um, and our prediction is that in these regions, anything that influences decisions should influence neural activity. So we predict an influence of both evidence and urgency. Um, so what should that look like? So evidence should look a bit like this. And if urgency is some rising function, then if the two get combined in some way, it should look a bit like this. Uh, this should be our kind of our predicted neural activity. But of course, if there's some a process that, that aborts the, the deliberation when you reach some threshold, then you should, it should look a bit more like this. So now if we record in dorsal premotor cortex, uh, this is I'm just gonna show you population activity. We see this in easy trials, uh, this in ambiguous trials, and this in misleading trials. It looks in, in fact very much like what we would predict. Um, and we see something quite similar in primary motor cortex even, as if the decision is actually unfolding within these regions. Now, <clears throat> uh, the effect of urgency can be seen in sort of the, the general trend of rising activity in these three trial types. We can actually infer it and calculate it more precisely in all trial types, just by looking at what is the, the function relating neural activity to sensory evidence after one token jump, two, three, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see there's a fairly good relationship, a sigmoidal relationship between neural activity and sensory evidence. But you can also see that it rises over time as if there's a growing urgency, uh, an additional source of activation. And we see that also in primary motor cortex. Um, now, and also you might expect the urgency should be higher in the fast block. So if we compare here neural activity, let's say in easy and misleading trials, uh, in the slow block and we compare it to the fast block, we see that it is indeed higher in the fast block significantly. And then we can do the same kind of analysis um, in the slow blocks and fast blocks. Um, to the, and then what we, what we wanna do to sort of infer neurally uh, the urgency signal is um, look at what is the neural activity just at the zero evidence point. So what's the sort of evidence independent uh, neural activity? And that's just kind of what it looks like. This is what it looks like in PMD um, here's what it looks like in M1. It looks a bit like what we inferred from the monkey's behavior. Um, <clears throat> now, um, one question then, of course, is, all right, well, that's fine for these regions, but what is the source of this evidence signal? Um, and I think in this kind of task where it's a um, kind of an abstract rule, I think everyone, including us, would predict that it should be prefrontal regions, in particular, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So we did some recordings here. This is unpublished. This is so far just one monkey data. But even with a small number of neurons, you can see very clearly this, uh, this pattern in prefrontal cortex. Um, so we think that's providing the evidence. Then the question, of, of course, is, well, what about the urgency signal? Now, here I want to take a, a brief detour. Um, I want to just make an observation that the reward rate depends, of course, on the time taken to decide. But it also depends on the time taken to move. And in fact, if you take more time to decide, you could save some time by moving faster. Um, also, if you, if you took a wild guess, if you took a lot of time deciding and you just didn't know what to do and you just took a wild guess, then maybe there's less need for precision in your movement, you can move faster. Uh, so that predicts an inverse relationship that if you look at trials with different decision duration, the reach duration should be decreasing. And in fact, that's what we see. Here it is for monkey S in the slow block, in the fast block, uh, here it is for monkey Z. In fact, it looks a bit like the inverse of the urgency signal that we inferred from the decision behavior. So the, dura the, the duration of the movement uh, is related to the urgency at the time of the decision, it seems. Um, and our proposal is that the urgency signal at the time of the decision influences the vigor of the action that's made. And that, of course, would then uh, imp imply the basal ganglia. Now, I, I'm, I know that in this audience, nobody's surprised by this. Uh, many of the people here have actually been uh, making these suggestions already that the basal ganglia uh, are um, contributing to the control of speed accuracy trade-offs. Um, so what we focused on was the output nuclei, the, G the globus pallidus external and internal segments, particularly targeting the regions that project back to PMD and M1. Um, and our predictions, if this is the source of the urgency signal, is that it shouldn't look like evidence, but it should have some ramping activity. Um, and what we find when we just do this kind of analysis, like we did up here, is we do, in, in fact, uh, see no, 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 um, no evidence for evidence, uh, certainly not in the globus pallidus internal segment. 
Um, but if we look at a subset of neurons in these regions, we, we find is there are some cells that build up over time uh, in a, again, target uh, nonspecific way in both structures. And we also see decreasing cells that decrease over time, again, in a nonspecific way. Now, if, these, if this is sort of the, 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 the positive aspect of urgency, and this is sort of the inverse of the urgency signal because they're inhibitory, then you'd expect that when we compare slow to fast, these cells should be more active and these cells should be less active in the fast block. And that is in fact what we see um, quite clearly. And so that suggests to us that perhaps this is the source uh, of this urgency signal. Um, <clears throat> what about commitment? Now to look at the process of commitment, um, we can align our data on movement onset and then we see how it unfolds up until that point. And what we find when we look at PMD is that there's very conspicuous peak of activity that happens about 280 milliseconds before movement onset. In fact, that's pretty close to the monkey's um, non-decision time. Um, and what we see then, so we, we can, we're going to call this sort of putatively the moment of commitment. Um, that um, happens later in primary motor cortex. Uh, and also interestingly, uh, it happens late in prefrontal cortex. There's nothing really that predicts in prefrontal cortex the moment of commitment. So in other words, this leads us to suggest that prefrontal cortex is not making the decision and sending it downstream, that it's providing the evidence for a decision that's actually uh, reached uh, in these regions. Um, now, interestingly, you may notice that it doesn't look like there's a threshold. Like, it's not like there's a single level of activity that determines this moment of commitment. Um, and it, it's quite different across the trials. But what we noticed is that the contrast between the winning and losing cells in each of the trial types is actually uh, quite similar. So we think what really determines the, the decision is a kind of a winner take all process when, the, when the, uh, one group of cells is sufficiently stronger than their competitors um, to, uh, to fall into an attractor essentially. And uh, we can test this by microstimulation. So we, we, we recently reported that a brief burst, 50 millisecond burst of subthreshold microstimulation in this region can disrupt this contrast and delay commitment if it's applied just before this moment. If we apply it back here, it doesn't really have an effect because presumably the system recovers. It's just a 50 millisecond burst. Also, interestingly, if we apply it here, uh, after the moment of commitment, but before movement onset, it also doesn't seem to have an effect, presumably because commitment has already happened. Um, so then um, interestingly also around the same time, we see um, uh, movement related sensitivity, tuning appearing in both globus pallidus and um, both segments external and internal. Suggesting to us that perhaps this evolving contrast between the cells is gradually spilling through the striatum, whoops, through the system to create a positive feedback. So to summarize this so far, <clears throat> we think deliberation is a kind of a competition that actually happens along the entire sensory motor system, uh, including parietal regions, et cetera. Uh, and the evidence biasing this competition in this task at least comes from prefrontal cortex um, and that urgency signal that sort of amplifies that competition from basal ganglia. A cortex develops a contrast gradually that then spills into uh, GPE through the striatum and then creates a kind of a, a, a critical point of positive feedback that then constitutes uh, volitional commitment to a reaching action. So we, our proposal is that commitment occurs essentially through this interaction between the cortical uh, um, and subcortical system. Um, and we, we're doing some modeling on this, but let, let me get to uh, some broader implications briefly. Um, uh, Matt's work, uh, uh, looking at this um, in the, into the psychological literature. So, so here's that equation that I showed for reward rate. You can sort of expand it like this in terms of all these various uh, terms. Now, these terms, all of them really um, are subjective. The, different people have different reward sensitivity. They have different subjective effort. They have different temporal discounting functions and factors. So therefore, they should, if, if they're measures of reward and the value of time, et cetera, and, and, and outcomes is different, they should have different urgency functions. And so you can imagine, for example, a low urgency individual that will take a lot of time and a lot of evidence to commit to a choice versus a high urgency individual that will make faster decisions with less uh, evidence. Uh, and now you can imagine what these um, subjects will do in different kinds of tasks. For example, in a task with constant evidence, and the freedom to respond anytime you want, a high urgency individual make 
will make shorter reaction times on average than the low urgency individual who will make longer reaction times. But then if you take these same two individuals and you put them in a task that's fixed duration. So here, uh, they're not allowed to decide at any point. They're just given a go signal and they have to just go at this time. Um, what should happen then is the high urgency in the individual will reach a higher level of urgency at that point and produce a more vigorous movement uh, than a low urgency individual that reaches a lower level at that same time. And so that predicts a kind of relationship between the timing of decisions and the vigor of movements. And that's in fact seen uh, quite broadly. There's many studies here. Um, those who move with more vigor tend to respond more quickly. And these traits are very stable and can be used to identify uh, even individuals. There's, the, you know, to sort of describe them, a group of people, a group of individuals that are sort of impulsive. They make decisions quickly. They have trouble with holding responses. They're sensation seeking prone to boredom. They have steeper discounting functions, et cetera. And on the other, on the other side, you'd see individuals with the opposite effects, more conservative. And you can imagine that the a sort of pathological uh, level of conservativeness is, is what you get in bradykinesia, where you're slowed. It's not an inability to move. It's a slowing of movement. It's insufficient motiva mo motivation and modulation of the motor system by reward, uh, uh, a kind of a pathologically diminished urgency. And then if you um, uh, treat this with dopamine replacement therapy or DBS, you could create in some cases, pathologically elevated urgency. And this, this has been seen, of course, you get significantly exaggerated temporal discounting symptoms of trait impulsivity, uh, impulse control disorders, et cetera. Um, certain aspects of major, major depressive disorders um, can be uh, discussed in this way. So there are effective symptoms, of course, but in, in, in addition, uh, major depressive disorder also has non-effective symptoms, the so-called activational aspects of motivation, low energy, apathy, fatigue, psychomotor slowing, less sensitivity to rewards, less uh, willing to exert effort, which is highly comorbid, in fact, with Parkinson's. And these uh, symptoms are not uh, well uh, alleviated by uh, serotonin treatments, uh, but actually are more responsive to noradrenaline and dopamine reuptake inhibitors. Um, and so our proposal is that these, uh, uh, these, these symptoms of major depressive disorders are related to some kind of diminished urgency. Um, so th this leads us to a kind of a dimensional view of, of urgency. You know, you can imagine that there's a normal population variability in this, and then you have, uh, you have people that, that are sort of lower in the urgency individual that have a certain constellation of, of phenotypes like slower responses, but better decisions maybe with less vigor. Higher urgency individuals that make fast decisions often take a lot of guesses, move with more vigor, et cetera. Um, and the, you know, maybe you'd call them impulsive. Uh, and then at the extrema of this, you get pathologies like uh, motivational symptoms of depression, psychomotor slowing, bradykinesia on one end, and the other end, things like mania, hyperactivity, impulse control disorders, et cetera. And so we're suggesting essentially that these psychological phenomena may be related to mechanisms that are fundamentally uh, related to um, uh, subjective maximization of reward rates. Now, uh, just in the last uh, few seconds of my talk, I just want to come back a little bit to the summary that I presented here, because I realized that it, it makes an implication. Uh, it seems to make an implication that I'm not sure I really want to make. And the implication here is that basal ganglia are not involved in the deliberation process. I suggested that you know, the deliberation process unfolds over here. And basal ganglia really only come on board after this positive feedback is, is, is established. All they're really providing is a kind of a motivation or urgency signal. But I don't think that's really the case. And I just want to come back to this, um, this view again of the uh, sort of elaboration of the decision systems in terms of these various uh, stages. Um, because what I really think, um, and this is speculative, I, I agree, is that basal ganglia are related in decisions in the more high level types of decisions. They, they sort of selectively invigorate or motivate a type of behavior. So the urgency signal is not just everywhere, but it's selective to a particular type of action to, to sort of amplify the activity in a particular sensory motor stream, uh, for example, like reaching. So if you've activated your reaching system, then it's up to the cerebral cortex to make the sort of lower level decision between where you reach. And the basal ganglia is sort of, um, um, it's sort of a higher level uh, control over which system gets to go when and how much effort should be expended. So in conclusion, um, we think there's this urgency and vigor signal that uh, certainly involves the basal ganglia, but probably other structures. 
uh, controls the speed accuracy trade-off in both decisions and actions uh, to help maximize subjective reward rate and may have links to various uh, individual differences in psychopathologies. Um, and the interactions between cortex and basal ganglia are something like basal ganglia selectively invigorate and motivate a type of behavior by amplifying activities in the specific sensory motor uh, circuits. And then within that elect selected circuits, the activity unfolds on a map in cortex uh, of the potential actions until a single peak rises above the rest, creating this positive feedback that then produces the volitional um, commitment to a, to a decision. Um, so, um, so in our experiments, for example, we don't see the liberation because in our experiments, when the basal ganglia decides uh, that reaching is not going to be done anymore, uh, the monkey stops working in our experiments. Over. Anyway, I would uh, I'd like, just like to finish with this, and I'd, li I'd like to just thank in particular Matthew and David on whose work um, a lot of this, uh, this material is based. So with that, thank you, and I'll take questions. Thank you.